A few years ago, I decided that I wanted to begin a research project looking for consistent patterns between DMT and near-death experiences. Many people have suggested that perhaps the DMT experience is so intense, so acute, because it's the same substance that stands behind the near-death experience that many people report. And so in this video, I want to take you guys through the consistent patterns that we can observe and some of the really fascinating things that we can take from eyewitness testimonies. Stay tuned. The really fascinating thing about DMT as opposed to a lot of the other psychedelic substances is that DMT seems to be much more endogenous, much more natural to the human brain. There are some people who even suspect that DMT may be responsible for dreaming, but of course this is all in many ways speculation. Unfortunately at this point we just simply don't know enough. I think one of the things that really makes DMT stand out more than many of the other psychedelics is the fact that the experiences reported are so consistent with spiritual experiences, psychedelic experiences that seem to break through into the spirit world. Oh my god, now that I know what this, how ridiculous it seemed to just worry about the little things we worry about. like. <laughs> the thing that's interesting to me or really sad is that, you know, our culture has illegalized these substances, whereas when you listen to the vast majority of eyewitness testimonies and first-hand experiences, people are not addicted to these substances, they're not harmed by these substances. I mean, you have some individuals who naturally take things too far and use it too much, but I mean, that's true of everything. People can't even be held responsible with sugar, let alone, you know, a psychedelic drug. So I'm not really surprised or worried about that. But uh, what we find is that the vast majority of people who use these substances come back with deeply meaningful experiences, experiences of the spirit world that can really transform and enhance their lives. It was just a very emotional time between the both of us and we kind of sat there on the floor crying and hugging. And I wanted to, I wanted to try it again but like we didn't have much left, especially after his trip. I just never got to try it again. And like, I mean, I don't really have the urge to try it again because I mean, my trip was pretty um, satisfactory. I just listened to a testimony here this morning where a young lady was describing her experiences with DMT and how she was able to establish contact with her deceased father. She had a conversation with her deceased father and her father told her explicitly, you do know that DMT has to do with the afterlife. Please tell them I love them and that I'm doing okay. And he said, you didn't have to do this to see me. And I was like, well, that wasn't like my goal. I didn't know I was going to see you. And he was like, but you do know that DMT is connected with the afterlife. So I find it really fascinating that individuals are using these substances and coming away with these experiences that seem to allow us to recreate a near death experience, at least to some degree. You know, when you look at a photograph of a galaxy, a galaxy is made up of little points of light, stars, right? And in this case, it was infinite. It went on forever. Little points of light. I was one of those points of light. And we were all connected. So it was like every being who had ever lived was there. And we were all connected. We were all one thing. And now, we were separate. I was still Raymond, me, 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 me. <laughs> but I was also we. We, collectively together, were God. I think the first thing that really stands out to me that's very unique about the DMT experience is how people will describe the room beginning to dissolve. And now this is something I personally have observed myself where the environment around you begins going to pieces and you really get this powerful sensation that your life is merely just a dream, that everything that's happening all around you is the substance of our psychological reality. Everything around me started shaking and vibrating and kind of like, melting away in a way. Not like literally melting, but it looked like Play-Doh a little. <laughs> and 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 then I, I fell asleep. And 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 
only this time I didn't lose consciousness, but I knew that I had fallen asleep and, and, and I felt myself being sucked out of my core like a vacuum. I felt this wind on my face and I opened my eyes and I was on a gurney and there was a helicopter <laughs> with the, um, its blades going and I thought I was dreaming and so I just went back to sleep. From there, individuals consistently report moving into a tunnel or some kind of a uh, vortex that appears in front of them. And of course, this is not just consistent in the DMT experience, this is consistent in the near-death experience as well, as, <laughs> as well as in all the eyewitness testimonies that we have from Aboriginal communities who themselves describe descending into the spirit world. We can observe petroglyphs and rock art where in which Native Americans have painted spiraling patterns to describe their journeys in into the spirit world. So it seems fairly consistent that individuals who journey into the spirit world describe doing so through a tunnel or a vortex. The thing that I find really unique and interesting about the DMT experience, as opposed to perhaps some of the other experiences, is that the vortex, of course, in the DMT experience is generally quite colorful. There are many different patterns, many different patterns of light. Now this, of course, can be explained with the help of entoptic phenomena. When the brain comes under intense stimulus, intense firing of the neurons, there can appear in our visual system all kinds of uh, visual hallucinations that are geometric in nature. In fact, entoptic phenomena that form geometric lines and patterns are really, the <laughs> what you're really seeing is the neurology or the geometry of the brain. You're actually seeing how the individual neurons are constructing this inner reality, this inner experience of the mind. You know, uh, Dr. Eagleman in his great documentary, The Brain, The Story of You, talks about how really when we move through life, we're all moving through a simulation of the world constructed in our head. We all have this internally generated reality. Incredible as it may sound, this world lives inside your brain. You know, the brain doesn't see through the eyes, it doesn't hear through the ears. There's no sound getting into your brain, right? Your brain is trapped in this hard shell of a skull, but the, the eyes, the ears, the nose, all of the senses, they translate the experiences of the external environment into electrochemical signals, which the brain then in turn translates into this inner subjective reality, which neurologists refer to as the internal model. So in reality, you're dreaming at this very moment because everything you experience is happening in your head. And so when we talk about psychedelics and we talk about these trip experiences, right, what we're really describing is disrupting this inner reality of the mind. In fact, the, the video I just watched here a few minutes ago, this young lady's testimony, she describes how she distinctly felt herself to be inside her own mind, to be in the nature of mind itself, right, which is obviously symbolic, not literal, but it reveals something about the nature of these experiences and and when I say room it was like a room like I was standing like I could feel myself standing but it felt like I was standing inside my head inside my brain <laughs> it was really weird so that when individuals are moving up through this tunnel, they're moving through a reality that exists inside the mind, a psychological and subjective reality. And then they move out into a space. And this is where the testimonies will sometimes differ. Quite often in near death experiences, you will hear people describe venturing off into a void. This is something I've talked about in previous videos, right? The void of dreamless sleep that we read about in the Mandukya Upanishad, the, the Hindus, right? This is the void of dreamless sleep we all visit when we we go to sleep at night, but we usually use lose consciousness in this space. But what the mystics of Aboriginal societies all around the world and shamans of ancient civilizations understand is that the goal of a religious experience, the goal of venturing into the spirit world, is to penetrate into the depths of the unconscious mind without losing your waking awareness. Dr. David Lewis Williams of Witswater University in South Africa talks about this at length in his book, The Mind in the Cave. And I would really encourage you guys to check that out. As I felt myself sort of being pulled upwards through my body and my chest and in my head, and I could see like, um, I remember this very vividly going into it, um, like a funnel or a tunnel 
uh, like our cylinder going upwards. It, and like through all these tunnels and really fast, I couldn't see. Like it really anything in detail, just shooting through. And I know that I was moving, but it was fast, like light speed or faster. It felt like I was going inside of my my like my mind instead of like out of my body. It was like inside of my head, and it was nothing but darkness literal darkness and I'm like looking around and can't see anything and I'm like fuck I just died off of taking some stupid ass drug you then see that this area that you're in uh, that you're passing through takes the shape of a tunnel the next thing that I experienced or realized that I was in this um, huge vastness of just nothing just darkness as I looked through this darkness, I could see energy churning, and the energy was moving through the blackness, and, and light was coming out, and the light was moving down to the end of wherever I was going, and it was forming the light. I was just sort of sitting there watching myself, and the next thing I knew, I was going down a tunnel. The darkness that I found myself in was so expansive. It was uh, went out to eternity. Uh, it was boundless. But what we hear described is people will venture into this void, this blackness, this vast emptiness during a near-death experience, but this only occurs sometimes in DMT and other psychedelic experiences. Quite often with psychedelic experiences, the individual will simply venture into a more dream-like nature of mind. They'll venture into a space that's dominated by elves and various other entities, and it's there that they will have their meaningful experience. Whereas often in the case with NDEs, with your death experiences, people will go beyond that into the void of dreamless sleep and there they encounter the white light. I was drawn into a tunnel that to me the, the words I can describe it are almost an opalescent blue beautiful beautiful and at the end of the tunnel was a, pin, a pinpoint of light and I couldn't do anything but go toward it and so I went toward this light and as I got to this light it became bigger and brighter almost like looking into the Sun but I it wasn't painful to look into this light and the light was in front of me and then the light was around me and then I was in the light and then I knew I was the light that there as a drop of water in the ocean is not separate. The light and I were made of the same substance. And I was home. Now that's not to say that DMT trip reports never involve the white light. They do. In fact, Shaman Oaks even talks about encountering the white light. And this is something that's really ubiquitous. We see this in DMT experiences and spiritual experiences as well as in near-death experiences. And the white light is fairly consistently equated with our modern notion of God. Of course, the Buddhists in the East, they describe this as the mind of all the Buddhas, the Dharmakaya. And when we enter into this space, there are some consistent consistent observations, some replicatable observations that we can see. For instance, the people who venture into these spaces, both in NDEs as well as on DMT, describe being able to communicate telepathically. They communicate with the entities there simply through the impulses of mind itself. There's an intuitive, telepathic, mind-to-mind -mind kind of communication. I could hear like somebody speaking to me like, like telepathy and, and we were communicating there's communication going on and uh, and but it was perfect communication it was like telepathic and, and, and uh, because it wasn't even using words really it spoke to me through like feelings and through emotions and through like telepathy through like the voice in my own head basically but it wasn't my voice it's really weird and it's really like hard to explain <clears throat> but I could hear him talking to me and through his mind, you know, not, not like he wasn't speaking, but I could hear him. The strangest thing, because he was not speaking to me using words, it, it was the same kind of a, he would communicate a feeling to me, and my own mind would animate those feelings with words. It was as if the communication was through intuition, it was through feeling, and then my own mind would create the, the English language in my head that, that these, these feelings would represent. 
Another thing that people consistently report is that they feel familiar in this place. Both DMT experiencers and NDE experiencers report that when they come into this space, it feels familiar. It feels as if they've been there before. And of course, when you understand this space to be the space of mind itself, the space of our subjective experience, of course it should feel familiar because it is the very nature of mind itself. It's quite wonderful in the Tibetan Book of the Dead, we're told emphatically again and again that when one enters into the afterlife, uh, the, the yogi instructs his disciples saying, do not be terrified, do not be frightened, but recognize everything as merely a projection of your own mind. Go forward saying these words clearly and distinctly and remembering their meaning. Do not forget them, for the essential point is to recognize with certainty that whatever appears, however terrifying, is your own projection. So really when you talk about the afterlife, you're talking about venturing into the nature of mind itself. This is something that Buddhists have understood for many, many years. What's also fascinating is that people who report their experiences on DMT as well as in NDEs often report hearing a disembodied voice, a voice that will speak to them and instruct them and give them advice. Uh, this is really fascinating because even Carl Gustav Jung, the great psychoanalyst, described that in his experiences of working with his patients, he observed that the self archetype is the intelligence behind this voice. So when you're in a dream, he said, and you hear a disembodied voice, this is the voice of the self archetype. For those of you who don't know, the self archetype is in many ways equivalent to our modern notion of God. According to Carl Gustav Jung, this is the organizing nucleus of the psyche. In that darkness, that void, there was a voice and the voice said, hey Quinn, I'm out here with you too. And I was like, what? He said, yeah, this is what unconditional love feels like. Love is the only thing that's real. I'm the only thing that's real. You need to go tell everybody that. And it was God, it was the voice of God that spoke to me and said, hey, yo, this is unconditional love. No matter how far you think you've gone, I'm still right there with you. And when people come into this space, they will sometimes see relatives, they'll see entities, they'll see various beings who give them advice, give them instructions, tell them what to do and what not to do. As in the case of this young lady, she had an experience with her father who told her, you know, don't come into this space just using DMT all the time. You've got to find other ways of seeing me, right? And I think that's a valuable lesson. I think that the psychedelic experience is useful. It's powerful. It's something that individuals can use, but it's not necessarily something we have to rely on and our ancestors understood this religious methods yogic breath techniques and dreaming lucid dreaming these things can drive us into profound altered states of consciousness that can allow us to make contact with the dead that can allow us to make contact with supernatural entities of course we've rejected all this in the modern world in favor of materialism the empty and meaningless belief that only physical things are real and I think that these experiences will serve to undermine this very superficial and, and unfulfilling philosophical view of reality. One of the things I find really fascinating is a continuity between NDEs, uh, near-death experiences, and DMT experiences, as well as the messages of the mystics, is this message that all will be well. You know, I hear many people reporting that when they have these experiences, you know, they come away from it saying, everything's gonna be okay, everything's gonna be okay, you know? Yeah, um, I was telling him like how much I loved him and you know, like how I wish I could just stay there with him. And he was like, well, you can't do that. You know, like I'm okay. And you know, he said one thing that really stuck with me, which was like, which was, you know, you're okay. I'm okay. Everything will be okay. Just keep doing what you're doing and you, you know, you'll find your path. And God said and showed me, showed me, he said, the, the love with which I love you now, I have always loved you. And that same love that I love you with now, I love your family and I love each person on earth with this fullness of love and forgiveness and knowing and mercy that you feel right now and beauty and all will be well and your family will be okay.
No one dies. Life and spirit is immortal. And it always reminds me of the great work of Julianne of Norwich, a famous Christian mystic who lived in England. And the message, she came back. She had this visionary experience of Jesus. And Jesus told her emphatically, all things will be well. All things will be well. And all manner of things will be well. You know, Jesus was really emphasizing to her that everything is going to be okay. And when you listen to these people and their near-death experiences or their DMT experiences, experiences, they often come away with this. They say everything is going to be okay. And what I find really interesting as well is that you hear people in these in these conditions reporting contact with entities that appear as orbs of light. You'll have these experiences where people see orbs of light that float into the room or float into the experience and communicate to them telepathically, you know, through the nature of mind. So there's this sense that in the spirit world, many entities appear as, as orbs of light, as these orbs of light that sometimes people will see. I was greeted by a being of some sort, a spirit of some sort, a floating sphere of awareness, and he knew me. I couldn't tell you what this thing was. It could have been an angel or a, I don't, it didn't look like, like anything. It didn't have a body, um, but it was an intelligent being like me. There was this orb and it was like a bright yellow and orange and it floated up to me and I just like looked at it and it started putting in images of my dad in my head and I was like oh that orbs my dad now, when people come into many of these experiences, especially experiences of the divine, they'll even have these revelations where they encounter this intelligence, which is said to be the creator. And what I find really fascinating about this realm, this realm outside of our reality, is that everything there seems to be made from light. Everything is weightless and dreamlike in nature. In fact, I am reminded of some of the testimonies where in which individuals felt themselves slipping into the spirit world as if it was merely just a dream. I went into a deep sleep and it was interesting because it was the first time I really had started to sleep on my side. I mean the seat belt had cut through me and it caused so many injuries to my midsection that I'd had to lay on my back for months but it was at this point that I just had started sleeping on my side and I recall going into a very very deep peaceful sleep. Now in that sleep all I know is I felt myself go back into that realm. Now when I say that realm, the realm I had experienced at the accident when I rose above the scene, that realm of love and light that I can only explain as home. I mean, home is the best word I can use for it. And so when we talk about these realities, when we talk about spiritual realities, we're talking about subtle realities, subtle, subtler even than this very flame, right? Because when we go into those experiences, we're talking about ethereal phenomena. And the problem today with modern science, you know, with empiricism, the way we've understood it, is that we don't really lend ourselves to believing in the reality of a phenomena unless it can be measured, unless it can be weighed, unless it can be definitively photographed and put onto a table. In fact, even when you talk about photographs, for many people that still isn't evidence enough. I mean, there's photographs of UFOs and Sasquatches, but that still doesn't convince anyone, right? In our culture today, the only way you really prove something is to hold it in your hand and bring it into the room. But when we, start, when we talk about spiritual experiences, these things are not material phenomena. There's nothing material about them. In fact, again, I'm reminded of Julianne of Norwich, who talked about, you know, her, the divine message to her relating that we must abandon our affection for material reality. And so in many ways, you know, our skepticism about these experiences is rooted in a certain kind of psychological and philosophical bias that denies the existence of subjective phenomena, subjective experiences. But I think that the consistency of these eyewitness testimonies, both in near-death experiences as well as in DMT experiences, helps to show that this is a reality. This is something which is definitively real because these experiences are not chaotic. They're not random. You listen to enough of these testimonies and it becomes emphatically clear that this is some kind of a spiritual reality, but it is just that. It is pure spirit and not physical matter. And so for that reason, I wanted to share this video with you guys to really emphasize the importance of using these substances in a responsible way to help us better understand the nature of mind and the nature of the world by experience. 
extension. And I think that research in these areas is really going to help us to come away with the conclusion that our old traditions, our perennial philosophies, the religious philosophies that have come down to us from many different cultures hold great validity and truth, especially those that we see coming from the Orient. I think that in many ways we see a real apprehension in the West towards these things because Christianity has lent itself wholesale over to the ideologies of the Bible and has forsaken, if it were, as it were, the messages of the prophets and the direct mystical experience. We can clearly see in the Bible that prophets were going into these altered states of consciousness, having experiences of the divine, and then coming back and relating those messages. That's really what built the Bible. And, you know, I'm reminded of the fact that when the prophets describe the angels, they say they're covered in eyes all around. And that's exactly what we see in DMT experiences, right? So it's pretty clear that what the prophets were doing in the Bible is similar to what we're seeing being done with these substances today. But many people, many Christians especially, have strong apprehensions about this because the reality is, is that they love their own ideas more than they love God. And that, I think, is a tremendous spiritual danger, not just to them as individuals, but to our society as a whole. And so I really hope that this will help you guys to understand the role of these substances and their importance, and also to appreciate the essence of our spiritual life, which itself lends life a tremendous amount of richness and meaning. And as always, thanks for watching.